So, um, uh, unless we have to shout more numbers, we can do that endlessly, right? Until we've reached all of them. But um, let's give it a start. So we're going to talk about flow. Uh, and um, let's start with, uh, with the beginning, right? So uh, we're going to start off with some short history of methodologies, right? Just a brief history. I'm going to try to do this in four minutes or something. Um, so we should probably start with waterfall, right? Um, and um, <laughs> you, do, do you guys know where waterfall comes? How old it is? Do you know how old it is? What's the year waterfall came out? Anybody? Any idea? Older than it's older than most of you. But it's younger than me, by the way. But um, <laughs> it started off in 1970. So in 1970, there was this guy called Winston Royce. And Winston Royce wrote this beautiful white paper. It's actually pretty good, by the way. Um, and it's called The Managing the Development of Large Software Systems. In this particular white paper, he actually describes, well, ways of doing software development, right? And this is 1970. So before he wrote this down, there was no methodology, right? It's, it's, it was a happy place, basically. And, um, uh, and then he invented waterfall. Well, he basically didn't invent it, but there is this picture in the white paper, and it looks like this. You've seen this, right? You, you should have seen this, right? Or, or you're still in it, and then you might say, hey, that's my daily work. But um, this is basically what people describe as waterfall. It's a one-off model where each of these stages is executed once. And the next one doesn't start until the previous one is finished, signed off, agreed on by all the stakeholders and everybody in the building, and probably some government agency as well, and then you can continue to the next stage. Now, there's lots of issues with this model, right? We all know the issues with this model. By the way, the, the reason it's called Waterfall is because in 1970, the text editor that Winston Royce had could not put seven blocks on the same line. It's a true story, by the way. So, uh, and, and it's a really interesting story. The nice thing about this white paper is if you read on to this, see, this is figure two. There's more figures in the white paper. I never read the text. I just look at the pictures, right? Uh, and, um, and, and the next picture in the white paper is actually figure three. And figure three actually says, hey, wait a minute. What if it's not right? What if we later decide that it might be better to do it again and revisit and go back and back and back again? Right? And he actually says, hopefully the iterative interaction, mind the word hopefully, between the various phases is confined to successive steps. He's basically saying, well, let's hope it's not that we are testing and then we discover that the requirements were wrong. And we all know that they will be wrong, right? This is what happens every day in our life. So actually what he is describing is ways to go back. And you might actually say, well, doesn't that look a little bit like Agile? If you just squeeze the period of time into going back until like probably two weeks, four weeks, whatever we do, right? Um, you might say it looks a bit like Agile. Further down the white paper, he says, note that it is simply the entire process done in miniature to a time scale that is relatively small in respect to the overall effort. I actually know this line by heart. It's pretty cool, right? It's like, uh, it's the only thing I know by heart, by the way. Uh, and um, so he actually says, wait, if you push this into small, let's say, iterations, or you might even call it sprints, then you're much better off. Now, that is pretty much what Agile is. Mind you, this is 1970. This is the stage where people were actually putting holes in cards to write code, or they started writing COBOL and other modern languages, right? This is... Well, COBOL dates from 1956, I think. But So it's early on, right? He actually invented Agile. And then you might say, why do we do waterfall all the time? Well, basically because many of these organizations that wanted to do software development, large government agencies in the US mainly, didn't get through to picture three. <laughs> so most of the waterfall methodologies were actually based on that previous picture. Winston Royce never intended to invent waterfall. Actually, his son... Uh, uh, later on also, like lots of white papers, he said, well, my dad never wanted to do this, right? And I'm sorry for this. True story again, right? I'm telling true stories today. That's kind of new, right? So, so, and then eventually, long time after that, why we did lots of iterations over shorter and shorter sprint or, or cycles, like we did unified process and um, uh, lots of these methodologies in the 80s, like the spiral model and stuff. And then eventually we got to this thing called Agile. Now, Agile is an interesting thing, and when I first started doing Agile, Stefan, you will remember, because you were there, basically, and um, um, we did this, it was in 2001, I think, we started doing seminars on how to do Agile, and um, in Belgium, basically, where we started doing this, and, then, and we, we looked into this, and hey, this is brand new, and then, then this is what lots of people thought Agile was, basically, right? 
you know, where that you, do, you do, well, we're going to do Agile, and that means basically we don't document anymore, we don't plan anymore, just write code, and then we'll see what happens. And the nice thing is, 20 years down the road, or 22 years down the road, this is exactly what I'm doing. And I didn't learn basically anything in between, I guess. I hope not. So, um, and then we went into this thing called Scrum, right? And then a lot of people started adopting Scrum. And Scrum is like, well, it's basically, somebody actually yesterday on Twitter said, well, isn't Scrum like sort of an addition to XP, Extreme Programming? I said, yeah, it's sort of like your appendix. It seems to do something. Nobody knows what. And once they pull it out, you don't notice it. It's that, basically, right? So here's Scrum, and Scrum is not Agile, and Agile is not Scrum. You can, do, you can be very Agile without doing Scrum. And you can do Scrum without actually being very Agile. And then the Agile community took over, and people invented that you could make money from Agile and started inventing certifications and stuff. Um, and, and then some of these original authors of the Agile Manifesto in 2001, they were like, yeah, you know what, Agile is dead. Um, and they say like, um, well, um, unfortunately, I think time has proved me right. The word Agile has been subverted to the point where it's effectively meaningless. Um, and what passes for an Agile community seems to be largely an arena for consultants and vendors to hawk services and products. Right. You, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it is, right, these days. So, so lots of people are looking at this. And, and I actually stopped going to Agile conferences. Being a developer, you don't belong in Agile conferences anymore these days because they do stuff like this, right? This, these are actual quotes from Agile conferences from recent years. Like, make sure you don't miss the Agile elephant versus the waterfall elephant in the lobby. I have no idea what this means. Or, <laughs> during this session, we are going to discuss the happiness index of projects. Or, add re ready for celebration before the done column on your Kanban board. What? And my, my good friend Alan, he started basically saying, like, he said, well, more and more, I came to, the re to see the term Agile as both unnecessary and self-defeating. Agile has come to mean do part of Scrum badly and use Jira. <laughs> Now, this is where we need to stop, right? That is why we're going back to just, well, writing code, right? That's it. And the question is, what do we do then? Well, of course, we need to make money, but Kim's going to explain lots and lots about that, too. So let's introduce ourselves first, right? So this is me. Uh, I'm Sander. I'm currently uh, uh, the freelance CTO for an e-commerce company, which finally brings me to the point that I can actually do e-commerce, which is the case you see in all the courses that I've seen over the last 40 years, and how I'm actually doing it. And it's far more complicated than all the examples in the books, right? I didn't realize that. So um, I'm basically uh, an independent dad. I have three kids. Kim has two more, by the way. Um, uh, I speak sometimes. I write a bit. I should write more, actually. I travel a lot. That's why I don't write. Uh, and I'm basically a programmer. I write code every day. Um, I tried to write code in the airplane this morning, but I didn't have Wi-Fi, so I couldn't check my code in. But that's what I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, and this is my e-commerce company. We won Website of the Year Award last year. All of a sudden, we didn't even know. We didn't pay for it, actually. And we still won. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's introduce me. So I'm Kim. Uh, I have a boyfriend. That's him. Um, and I also have uh, uh, two kids of my own. He has three, so we have a, a full house, basically. Um, I, um, I love leadership. Uh, I have been doing that in tech for a long time, and I'm gradually trying to step more and more into tech. Uh, that's going horribly because leadership is pretty busy. So every attempt I do is constrained to Friday from 3 to 4 before beers. Um, and it doesn't really get you far, so you're doing much better. Um, and I work at Schubert Fittis. Um, we're a company to help um, uh, other companies deal with their mission-critical IT problems. Um, and that basically means it has to be really important. If it fails, you hit the newspapers. Uh, so banks and postal offices and those kind of things, energy uh, providers. Um, so uh, because the benefit is then you get to do the job the way you actually want to. Uh, we get to do IT without any shortcuts, uh, without any uh, immaturity, but um, really make the length to do it the way we actually want to. Uh, we do that as a self-organizing company, so without any managers. Uh, that means I'm not a manager anymore, so I'm halfway there. <laughs> so why flow? I'm struggling with two things in my hand. I'm left, and I have no idea how to do this. Um, I'm going to fix it. So introducing flow. So why another methodology? Because Sander explained there's already a bunch, right? So we have enough. We're fed up. I see people actively nodding like, yeah, let's just skip it. Let's write some code. And we get that. 
Uh, but there's this other thing. We found this interesting correlation um, uh, because we both are consultants. Uh, and um, as a consultant, the longer you work on a project, the more money you make. So actually, we wanted to find a methodology that would actually make our projects last as long as possible. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because then we make as much money as possible. And actually, there was quite some inspiration in the methodologies that are already out there. We didn't have to invent a thing. So that's great. Um, but, but then the first thing we had to start with is the hardest problem when you find out a new methodology. Um, and that's basically, um, uh, well, <laughs> the next slide. That's naming. So we first had to find a name. I'm too far away from that thing. Um, yeah, we should switch. Um, so, um, uh, well, so when we started, we thought, well, we, did, we need Japanese words like Kaizen, Kanban, uh, Obeya, Origami. Um, we also needed to end with Krasi, like Holacracy, Sosocracy, Idiocracy, so nobody can pronounce it anymore. And we also need to start it with a D, like uh, Continuous Discovery, Disappointment, or Continuous Disagreement. Um, we also want more no and less yes. So we want um, a no ops, we want no projects and no estimates. Uh, we also considered no SQL, it was already taken, no testing, no code. Um, and um, of course, serverless, uh, pointless maybe. Um, and of course, everything is as a service. SaaS, EAS, PaaS, TAS. So we thought about AS, anything as a service. Um, I like that one. <laughs> maybe methodology as a service, mass. Um, and then in the end, we chose Flow because it fits really nice on laptop stickers. So that yep. was the premium requirement. It had to fit stickers, right? So um, this is an example when you just start. This is the um, novice sticker that you obtain uh, if you finish the certification, of course. Um, if you are advanced, you're going to go with the Flow. So uh, it's not just Flow. This is if you're a front-end developer. Um, and um, if you're even more advanced, you can feel the flow. So it's not that you, uh, you do Agile, but you are Agile, right? Wow. Um, <laughs> even more advanced, you surrender to the flow. And everything together is, of course, because we have this sticker on our laptops. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. So um, how do we make my money? So we put stuff in the methodology, right? So if you read the latest version of SAFE, which I did yesterday, SAFE 6, they now replaced, what did they call it? XP Scrum by SAFE Scrum or something. So just invent new terms and you'll make money, right? So, so basically, what do we need to keep in? Well, first thing to keep in is this nice thing called sprints. And you're like, whoa, what is he going to say about sprints? Do you like sprints? How many have you done? Have you done more than 400? Easily, right? Are you, do you still like it? You want to get rid of it, right? So, so what's the point about sprints? Well, sprints are basically, or iterations, whatever the phrase you use, are, they're basically like mini projects, right? You agree to do something in the next period of time, whether that's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. Um, you, you make an estimate, whether you do that in story points or t-shirt sizing or pizza points, whatever, right? Doesn't really matter. Basically, it doesn't matter, actually. But so, and then you make, and you, you go to the work, and then by the end of the sprint, you're usually not done, right? You know the feeling, right? <laughs> Terrible, right? So that's what, what we started calling a red sprint. It's basically, a sp I didn't invent this term, by the way. So this is a sprint you don't make. This, by the way, is a burn down chart from a project in Belgium, actually. Sorry, Stefan, but so this was in Brussels, and um, they, they asked me to come over because this was their five last sprint and they estimated see all the work and then well this was the ideal line and then by the end of the sprint right here right so i'm going to point try to point at it does it still work yes so by the end of the sprint they had some work left right and they're like ah shit we had some work left what now why well, we need to estimate better so this is the next sprint right and they got to the next sprint they estimated the work better right so more story points less story points uh, whatever you do, right? And, uh, and again, they had some work left. And then the project manager, yes, there was a project manager. This was in 2003, I think. Um, and, um, and he said, whoa, you guys are, you suck at estimation. Well, we know that, right? We all suck at estimation. We're, we're, we're developers. We don't do that. I had a fierce discussion earlier this week about estimation. Like I'm saying, estimates can never be wrong. It's an estimate, basically. It's not a calculation. <laughs> it starts to go wrong. That was sort of like the same reaction I got on LinkedIn for this, right? <laughs> so it starts to go wrong when people say, oh, um, um, and you say, well, like, oh, I think it takes about four weeks, right? And then the manager says, oh, so in four weeks it's done. No, 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 no. That means on average it will be done in four weeks, we think, now, 
right? Ask me again in two weeks where it's still the case. And this is what goes wrong in sprints too, because sprints are basically mini projects. So after the third sprint, that also failed, of course, uh, the manager got really angry and he's like, we need to do something different. We're going to hire more people. <laughs> I, I like this industry so much, right? And they, so he got um, uh, 300 people from India. Oh, there was, uh, no, <laughs> Oh, wait, that was another project. No, it, well, I think it was like 40 people or something from India. And you know what happened? They said, this was the next sprint. <laughs> they couldn't get it. Of course, well, if you have to train 40 new people on the team, well, you, you, you lose your productivity anyway. Like it's Laws Brooks that says uh, adding more people to a late, uh, adding more resources to a late project makes the project even later, which is very much true. And after the fifth and the sixth, they still had some work left. Eventually, um, the project failed. The project manager was fired, literally. The team went home very disappointed because they had to uh, do overwork and overtime for months and months in a row, and they had, to, uh, they had to eat sushi every night because that was the only food place that the manager could find within a reasonable distance from the office. So that's it for sprints. So we need to keep sprints in, right? Yeah, definitely. And we also need a thing called gamification um, because, um, ah. well, playing games is much more important than writing code, right? So um, there's this little thing in the Agile Manifesto that has been bothering managers a lot. And it's that it says the best designs and architectures and code actually come from autonomous teams. And if you're a manager, you used to make all the decisions. Now you have this autonomy thing. And that's quite hard. What do you do with that? There goes your job. So we actually think, well, yeah, autonomy is great, but, um, uh, well, they don't get to hire people because people are not experienced to do that. Uh, they don't get to fire people because they can be really hurtful and they're not trained to do that. Um, they you don't mean they're not trained to do hurtful <laughs> things? Sorry? You have to be a manager, right, to do hurtful things, right? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 no, I got it, I get it. I think actually people are relieved that you don't have to do that. That's, but, but I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. well, <laughs> Who would think it would be okay to tell somebody in the team you don't want to work together anymore? That would be hard, right? So we found the one thing that managers should, should keep doing, actually. Ah, yeah. That's nice. Sure. <laughs> Chief fire officer. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, well, they don't get to do uh, appraisals because uh, everybody is so positive about each other and, um, well, we're not. Um, uh, they also don't get to decide who is on the uh, team or what to work on or what is on the backlog. You don't do any grooming um, and you also don't get to spend any money. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, it will be autonomous, uh, but uh, we decide what's on the backlog. We decide who is on uh, what team. We decide the stack of the team. Uh, we decide actually what tools the team use. And you also, we also decide when, when you have meetings, basically. Lots. So, uh, but further than that, you will be autonomous. So that means you get to decorate your working space. Good point. Um, <laughs> so this is Zappos. Um, and, Feels like um, home, right? <laughs> it, it, yes. So this is what happens with autonomy. Um, uh, you actually can make it look like home. So does all your home places look like this? <laughs> um, this was me at a job interview for a uh, big e-commerce company. Yeah, I was mine, in a ball pit. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we're just overdoing it a little bit, right? Yeah. What do you think? I think at this, we, yeah, well, we should keep, uh, well, I, I think all the meeting rooms should have these balls and they were like to, up to your knees, right? Yeah. yeah. Nice, right? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. So then the problem is, how do we deal with teams and uh, how do we deal with roles? And of course, with resources, as we all know. Um, and um, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this, right? So um, here's the idea. Um, uh, it originated in the Scrum Guide, and the Scrum Guide actually, the authors of the Scrum Guide took it from a research that was totally unrelated to team size. It was basically about the amount of things you could keep in memory at the same time. And that was like seven plus or minus two. So they were like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's make our team size seven plus or minus two. And now the rest of the world thinks this is how it, it's, it's cut in stone now. You have to do this. Well, they changed it. Then it went from six plus or minus three. And I think in the latest edition of the Scrum Guide, yes, they have additions too. They have iterations of about five years. Um, and um, now it's, I think, less than 10 people or something, right? And, and to be honest, it doesn't really matter, right, what the team size is. Put as many people in the team as you can, basically, because that will slow you down. So there's other Agile approaches that are really, really good at this. For instance, there's a thing called Disciplined Agile. I think it ceased to exist by now for a good reason, basically, because, well, they had all these roles, right? This is an Agile approach that has some roles. By the way, 
this picture does not include the roles within the team. This is just the people outside of the team that have to manage it or whatever they do. I have no idea what these people do, by the way. But it can get worse, right? You can go into stuff like this. Anybody doing this? Quit your job. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So, so this is auto scrum. It was invented by, it's not, this is invented by uh, Accenture. Is anybody working for Accenture? Quit your job. So, no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I'm still not sure whether this was meant ironically or that you're actually serious about this. There's other people who built similar things that are actually serious about this, and they're the people who invented SAFE. Now, we're going to do our annual SAFE quiz, which is about can you point out where the customer is in the following picture? This is a previous version, by the way. Don't worry, don't worry. So where's the customer? Well, it's the, the little uh, uh, thing on the side here. <laughs> uh, it's the thing that's been hit by this train, right? So it's like, a, that's basically how it feels, right? You're the customer, you're sitting there, bah! all of a sudden, 400 consultants in your place. It can go worse, because they just come up with a new edition. This is uh, f um, safe six, I think. They're already at six. We're only at three. Why are we only at three? Uh, well, anyway. You have to so, do something about this. So, okay. And now the next question is, where is the customer now? He's gone. <laughs> I think when, when they hit him with the train, they just moved him out of the picture, right? So they're like, run over by the train, exactly, right? So yeah, there's this customer centricity, but it doesn't say that it's actually the customer there, right? So yeah, pretty cool. So that's safe. Um, then we have to talk about people, or as managers call it, resources. Yeah, that's, that's us, right? The resources. Where, how many resources do you need? Can I have some additional, like in the management team, how many resources do we actually need to do this? Um, uh, what do you mean? Like computers or people or what? What? what tables? Chairs? Uh, and, and the good thing is, well, you know what? They're called us resources anyway, so let, let's just all be resources, right? By the way, I think in Flow, if you want to be a resource, you need to have a beard. Um, <laughs> Well, flow is not really inclusive, I guess, right? So, <laughs> no, no, no. So, uh, women too. Women can have beards too, right? So, it's, uh, it's, it's equal. So, um, and, um, and, and then there's these agile coaches, right? Who have you, is there anybody an agile coach or a scrum master for that matter? It would be oh, very good, good. brave you, if you now raise your hand. Yeah, that would be really cool. <laughs> I want to see that happening. <laughs> so, you've seen these agile coaches over the years, and they sort of drifted away from having anything to do with software development, right? They sort of invented their own terminology, and they went in to do stuff like this. The Obeya Knowledge Network meet up in Amsterdam. I wasn't there. But um, last Friday, it's probably a while ago, but they do all this instrument, as uh, Obeya as an instrument for a better world. I, okay, so and then they went into like conference that are called Play, uh, and uh, a celebration of playfulness, serious gaming, and experimental learning. I have no idea what it has to do with what we do, but it's there. Or like this, right? This is from the same meeting, and they have like, day one was packed with learning moments. Yes. Games and exercises to help us understand the essence of flow. I didn't write this, by the way. So, and, and then we, we zoomed in on the agile, the, the, the marriage between Scrum and Kanban. Good point. Good idea, right? Let's do that. And, and then we have like liberating structures. These are basically ways to make um, meeting, meetings more um, infantilized, if that's a good word. Um, so, so we invent all sorts of games and things that we can use to make our meetings more, well, whatever, game of fight or at least to keep people busy. I especially meant to be more inclusive, actually. What? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And, and, and the only thing I can think of is, so it's like, uh, oh, oh, there's even more. These are all the liberating structures. Right? You have things like helping heuristics, conversation cafe, um, uh, simple ethnography, or user experience fishbowl. Good, good point, good point. So it is, and the only thing I can wonder if I see this is like, where is my code? Right? I'm a developer, I, write, I don't want to do all this stuff. I just want to write code. That's what I do, basically. Right? Yeah, definitely. So next up, we also thought, should we keep DevOps? Yeah. Uh, because it actually tends to work, so that wouldn't make our project last longer, but we definitely chose to keep it. Because you can actually have lengthy discussions, and people do, about the order of the words. So there's somebody who says, well, it should be ops dev, because ops is actually more important than development. So then at least we can front load the ops consideration. And one guy even took that beyond. Well, he said, well, um, uh, forget DevSecOps. Maybe it's SecDevSecOpsSec. Sec, sec, sec. <laughs> 
Yeah, because security is actually important at the beginning and in the middle and at the end. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, but actually, uh, Patrick de Bois coined the term, and there was never a grand plan for this word. Um, he was working in system administration, what we know, now know as operations, and he wanted to do a conference. He wanted to do a conference because he saw that the developers were becoming more agile, and that translated in different demands. And these demands weren't being um, uh, translated correctly to system administrations because they were still asking, um, well, can you three years in advance tell me how many VMs, CPU, and disk space do you need? And the developers actually had no clue because they were looking at the next sprint, which was red. Hmm. So that didn't work. Um, so we're definitely going to keep it. Um, and in our collaboration mindset, well, um, we think we should be inclusive, so we're going to go for community. Uh, we should keep development because we still think it matters when you uh, do software development. We want to keep operations. Uh, we also want some analysts because we need to think a bit more in advance. And we want security at the end. That's our decision. So that will be uh, com DevOps anal sex. Um, <laughs> We, we did some investigation. People responded strangely. We don't get it. Um, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you can. <laughs> And, um, uh, but we, we, because of the funny responses, we, we just went for res uh, as resources because that's what they're called anyway. Yeah, yeah, we are. That's, that's right. So, um, and then we have to talk about meetings and stuff and why we have meetings. And so let's, let's do them quickly, right? Because I'm not really a big fan of meetings. I try to get around, out, out of meetings. Um, like I'm saying, no, no, sorry, I don't have Teams installed, so I cannot join this meeting. And um, it takes about 15 minutes to start up on my laptop anyway. But uh, so um, let's talk about these things, right? Stand ups. How many stand-ups have you been in more than 2,000 stand-ups? <laughs> Easily, right? Easily. <laughs> like, like 200 per year. I've been doing this stuff for like uh, 25 years almost. So I must have been in thousands of these things, right? In the beginning, it was pretty cool when we started doing stand-ups, like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And yeah, pretty cool. We have stand-up and everybody was looking. What are you guys doing? Oh, can we have that too? Yeah, sure. Just try it out, right? And, and, all, and at some point in time, I just got so bored of it, right? <laughs> we still do it every day because, because it is, well, sharing is caring, right? And I know what my team is doing. I missed the stand-up this morning, but I'm pretty sure that I know what they're doing today because, well, I worked with them the whole day yesterday. And, and, and it's okay, but eventually they'll become boring as fuck, basically, right? So, um, and that's, so we need to keep them in anyway, right? So no matter what we do. And then there's this other thing that people do. <laughs> so one of the longest projects I've been to, we, we got to iteration. We, did, we still did sprints and iterations. Iteration 76 on the same project team. And we had retrospectives every two weeks. And every two weeks, there was somebody saying, yeah, 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 Jan Bart should really pay attention to doing this and this. And then Jan Bart said, yeah, yeah, of course, you'll, I'll do that. And two weeks later, uh, we were like, uh, well, Jan Bart, how did it go? And he said, yeah, yeah, sorry, didn't have time for it. And well, you know what, Jan Bart, you need to pay more attention to this and this. And then Jan Bart says, yeah, sure. Well, it got repetitive, right? It's really repetitive. And we didn't change anything basically anymore because, well, that's the way we were working and it was fine. And so we stopped doing this. So about retrospectives, um, I think there's a few things to mark. Um, uh, the things you can do in retrospectives, and of course in, in Scrum it's called the sp whatever sprint review meeting, and you do demos, right? So you start two days before the stand, before the retrospective, preparing your demos, right? So you don't spend any time on any other stuff. Just prepare the demo because the manager is going to be at the retrospective and he's going to want the demo, right? And then we do the demo, and of course the demo will fail. Because demos always fail. I just want to stop doing code on the stage because it always fails, basically, right? So, um, and then, um, well, we can always discuss how to go faster. And of course, we never do because uh, Agile wasn't actually meant to go faster. Uh, and we never follow up on our improvements anyway. So it's basically a nice way to repetitive spend a lot of time with very little, well, very little use, usefulness, I would say. And the thing is, basically, we should look into what do we as the developers do, right? We write code. And if we write code, that is not an easy thing to do because it takes place here. It doesn't take place on the keyboard, right? It place, takes place in your head. 
which means it takes some adaption time to get to the point that you can actually start writing code. And that is called flow. Coincidentally, it was there longer before we started thinking about this. And it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to start editing code after resuming work from, a, from an interruptance, right? That means if you have a stand-up meeting and you get to the office two hours before or an hour before, I have a guy on my team who actually starts working at 6.30 in the morning, uh, and then we have the, the stand-up at 9.30 in the morning. He's already spent three hours. So first of all, what do people do is, if they come in like at half an hour before the stand-up, they don't do anything before the stand-up. Well, they read their email and stuff, pretty useful stuff, I guess, but um, they, they can't get into work because the soon that they get to the stand-up, well, they've got to break the flow, basically, right? So the thing you need to do, um, if you want to be successful in prolonging your projects, is make sure that you have as many interruptions as you can during the week, which basically means we'll organize random meetings. Like um, uh, the product owner all of a sudden called, we need to look at this new design that they made at marketing and we need to build it now. Uh, yeah, sorry, we're already building this stuff, right? And why can't you wait until, no, it needs to be now. No, that happens all the time, right? Um, so we figure we do our random meetings throughout the week, doing all sorts of stuff, basically. Um, and we'll just tell them like two minutes before the meeting is actually going to start, or basically three minutes after the meeting has started. Uh, and we'll do them about anything that we can think of. KPIs, OKRs. Uh, retrospectives, design meetings, UX, UI, you name it, test meetings, whatever you can think of, right? Just think of some arbitrary meetings and organize them during the week with random topics. By the way, um, they should last for an hour at least, and the whole team needs to be there on Teams, <laughs> which is a requirement, right? So, um, and yeah, well, we call this flow meetings, basically, just because they interrupt the flow. And the problem with it is we have a hard time uh, standing up to this, basically, as developers, right? Because on most cases, our autonomy doesn't reach the level that we can say, stop, I'm not going to this meeting, talk to the hand, or whatever you say, right? So, uh, and, and that's because our self-organization, well, we're not good at it, right? We're introverts usually, except for me, I guess, but, uh, and, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that means we find this really, really hard, because self-organization for most people is out of their comfort zone. On a lot, if you look into the tech people, if I look into my own team, these are really nice, sweet, and I love them a lot, uh, people that, that are, are introverts, and they, they have a hard time organizing themselves. And the problem is, me as their CTO, just part of the team too, right? I find it really hard to actually help them get there, right? Because I can say, yeah, you need to be self-organizing, and then you need to figure out what else you need to do to get there to that point. And that is really, really hard. So we should keep self-organization in if we want to do flow, right? Um, and the last thing, the only thing that actually helps in our place is this. I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is my team. We're mob programming. This really, really works. So this we're not going to do in flow, right? <laughs> yeah, but it is fun. So we should keep some fun in. You're allowed to do mob programming. Oh, good. In version 4.0. and what? you can we get should, certified. We should go to version 6, I think. Ah, yeah, let's do that. So um, what else we need is a flow in the enterprise, because that's where the real money is. Oh, yeah. So um, the question is, is Agile actually multiple iterations of the same process? So can any team just look at their own backlog, do the job, or do we need a large-scale process? I think you know the answer. Um, so uh, one idea is uh, let's all just copy Spotify. Um, because Spotify is a company that has been very successful. I think there's a speaker here from Spotify. Um, and um, uh, very successful. So basically, if we just copy what they are doing, then we will be successful as well. So let's do that. Um, uh, so except that Spotify invented the Spotify model at a moment in time where they were growing 8x every year. So that means that if you are in a team of about 10 people, um, you're the only one that was there last year. The rest is new. Imagine that. <laughs> every year, every year. So what you in that case need is a lot of guidance on your values, on your culture, on your ambitions, on your tech stack, on everything that you do as a company. You need to talk a lot, you need to communicate a lot. So what Spotify did in this model, they had a one to two ratio of people, uh, of managers versus uh, people. One to two. So that's crazy. That's what you need when you grow rapidly. Um, and then other companies start copying that, like big banks in, in the Netherlands. They don't grow ADEX every year. <laughs> they haven't been growing for a while. So, and, and what they did, what made it actually worse, is they kept all the layers of management that they already had. 
So that meant that at the end, they had a ratio of about one to one. There were as many managers as people, and they were wondering why they weren't progressing on their project. This is the answer. So uh, we definitely want to keep that, because that can actually give us a lot of money. Um, so we um, introduced BigFlow Framework, short BFF. Um, and in BigFlow Framework, we're going to start with version 3.0, because that's popular. Um, and uh, we will definitely add more complexity with every release, like safe. We will not plot the customer on our pictures. Um, and of course, we will copy Spotify. <laughs> and we also will copy uh, Basecamp, because uh, that's what everybody does. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have one more slide. Yeah, it's new. So this is research. <laughs> and it shows, actually, um, in very small uh, numbers, that in a bunch of factors, they compared every scaled Agile framework with none at all. And the none at all was best. <laughs> so I think we should do all of them, right? So that's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably it. So uh, another thing we really need to think about is tooling, right? Because we're, we're developers, we need tooling, right? So what tooling do we actually need? Well, let's have a look at it, right? So we need boards. That's right, we need boards. We need rooms full of boards, basically, right? So this is a picture I took uh, in, uh, in Lille, in France, uh, of, of a project that a company I was working for before, large consultancy, you guessed it, right? Because they wear suits, and um, um, that we're working on, and this was their board. Nobody basically understood what, uh, what it was on, because that's the way boards work, right? You make them so complex that when the customer or the stakeholder actually comes into and look at your boards, they don't understand what's happening, right? So this kind of, oh, this is really good, right? So what does that mean? What's that red, little red dot there? Um, oh, yeah, well, stuff like that, right? So they don't understand anyway. So let's, let's get ready. By the way, um, in Flow, I think every board should have at least 20 columns. It's just to make sure that you never get to the end, right? Um, and um, if you are doing enterprise flow, which Kim just described, right, you're required to have a room to put them in, which is called the board room. Makes sense, right? And then one more thing you need to have is called a burn chart. You're all aware of the thing called a burn down chart, right? So it was the thing I showed earlier. Well, one of the projects that we were working, we actually were working on it both, and um, uh, we call it a burn chart because basically what happened is that the further the time got, we, we did finish stuff, actually, right? So that is, which one is that? Uh, story points. The green one. The green story one, Story right? points resolved. Oh, yeah, that's the story points resolved. So we actually finished stuff, right? But they kept on adding stuff to our backlog, which basically means that the purple one is the things that we didn't finish yet. So it, it grew in the same amount as that we were finishing off stuff. So this project was never going to end. It never did, by the way, but um, so, so this is basically called a burn child because, well, you burn lots and lots of money and there's no progress whatsoever. Good point, right? I like this tooling. This is the tooling I want to have, right? And also, yes, of course, um, this is mandatory, right? So uh, Jira is um, uh, everywhere. Um, by, by the way, Jira means agile. So if you do Jira, you're agile. So that's the easy way to get into Agile. And uh, well, you should have Agile. You should have a Scrum board in, in Jira. But you should also have a Kanban board in Jira. I have no idea why there's two. They look pretty much the same to me anyway. But um, I found yeah. a difference. There's a difference? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what drinks. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, let's do beer first before we talk about Jira, right? So um, and then people put all of their estimates in there and the hours they work. We actually look at uh, uh, use it as a booking system as well. By the way, people also put all of their requirements and their whole design into Jira as well. So that means you can never find back if you finish the ticket and it's somewhere down the line. You can never find back what the agile decisions were that you made. So yes, let's put everything in Jira. Um, and by the way, then, um, uh, because people want to stay in flow, we need to do some more stuff. We need to have open floor plans. You like open floor plans, right? That's why 500 people sit in one room, they all chat, well, half of them, and the other half is trying to work. And they're not managing because, well, they're in the open floor space and there's lots of noise. So um, there's actually research being done that says, well, yes, your, op your office's open floor plan is ruining your productivity. Yes, I want that in flow, right? So open floor plans are mandatory in Flow. By the way, if you can't deal with it, that means uh, the next step is to get um, noise canceling headphones for all the developers, basically, because otherwise they can't concentrate. Um, the resources, I mean, sorry, I didn't talk about developers. By the way, you need to have tattoos on your, uh, on your arms. Um, um, well, actually, we could get a flow tattoo, uh, uh, so that would be cool, right? Let's do that. And, um, and then, well, we also started to experimenting with augmented reality, but the problem was we couldn't see our code anymore, and then, well, we sort of abandoned that experiment, right? 
One more thing you need to do, by the way, these are all the tools you need as a developer. Slack, of course you need Slack. Um, and, and we need Slack because basically if people get out of flow, um, then they don't produce, right? So in order not to produce, they uh, uh, spend lots of time in writing messages in flow. And the only way to communicate between resources is allowed uh, is uh, sending them a, a message on Slack. So the people sitting next to you, you just send them a message on Slack, they reply on Slack, that, way. that works pretty well, right? So they don't have to talk to each other, actually, right? Because that's, it's just wasting time talking, right? So we all communicate through Slack, that's the only thing to do. Occasionally, we do some pair slacking. Um, <laughs> works pretty well, actually. Uh, we also do uh, mob slacking these days. So we spend all our time in huddles. Uh, it sounds really cool, and it is actually. So, and we got one Slack channel per release, so we got loads and loads of Slack channels because we release multiple times per day. Um, and yeah, well, we need that, right? So, yes, did, did Slack you rules. see yesterday Salesforce announced that there will be a new version of Slack with AI integration? Oh, yes. They will automatically summarize all your Slack messages for you. <laughs> it will be there within a year, so hold on. Um, so, one more thing we need is manifestos, of yep. course. Um, so, something about the history of manifestos. A manifesto, um, like the Communist Manifesto, um, is something that has ideas. It's a published verbal declaration uh, about the intentions, motives, or views of the users. It was an instrument used to, to actually communicate great ideas. To have people read them thoroughly, to put the time and effort in it to write it down thoroughly. Um, and then came the manifesto for software development. It has four lines. Um, and, um, well, that's not true. There's also a line that says, well, while there's value on the, yeah, for the items on um, the right, uh, we value the items on the left more. Um, so, um, it, it was already a lightweighted version. There are 12 principles behind it. Um, not everybody knows you can click through on the website. Nobody reads those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then came, for instance, the Software Craftsman Manifesto and the HR, the Agile HR Manifesto. What is oh, I that? I like this one, like ambition <laughs> over obligation. <Woohoo>. Yes. <laughs> this is a real thing, by the way. <laughs> this is a real thing, yeah. So, um, inspiration and engagement over management and retention. Like, really? <laughs> So, um, and as a response, this one was, per, was issued, programming motherfucker, do you speak it? Manifesto. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Read this because it's really good. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, we're tired of being told what to do. Um, and of, of course, because, well, they, they obviously frustrate people. And frustration is good, makes projects long, last longer. So we're going to keep a manifest. So we have the flow manifest. Um, and in the Flow Manifest, we're going to have extensive certification over hands-on experience. Um, we're going to have copying methodologies over thinking for yourself. Um, we're going to have tool-driven confusion over building working software. Uh, endless meetings over focused flow. Mm. And of course, mandatory gamification over authentic autonomy. And that is while we ignore the things uh, on the right, we do the things on the left, just to be clear. Um, and uh, because, um, uh, because of the latest trends, we're going to uh, call it a microfest. So uh, it, had, it just has four lines. Everything micro, right? So we get to the most important part of all, all agile methodologies out there, no matter which one, except for XP, I guess. Uh, and that is, of course, certification. Because you all need certificates, right? I'm not really sure why, but people think they need certificates, right? So it's basically a good way to make money. So also in Flow, it's a good way to make money. So how are we going to deal with certifications in Flow? Or how are we dealing with certifications in Flow? Um, well, well, basically, well, we need to make money, right? So, um, and in Scrum, there's lots of these things. And there's, there's uh, tons of different um, uh, three-letter acronym certifications that you can get. Um, and, and the only thing you need to do for it is take the course, well, if you can. Uh, or otherwise, just take the multiple choice exam, right? So we figured, oh yeah, we're going to do that too. And, and once you did that, you're off and you can go coach any team out there in the world with your certificate and save the world, right, as a scrum master. So yes, that's it. So what are we going to do? Um, <clears throat> well, basically, um, the thing is we're going to lower our fences, right? So um, if you compare it to like a martial arts, right? So Kim did some martial arts, uh, uh, along with some. Uh, and um, um, this is, of course, the karate kid, right? So he spent tons of time just painting the fence, right? And washing the car uh, because he need to get it into muscle memory. How much time does it take you to become a master at karate kid? I don't know. I think 20 years and uh, 25 hours per week. Oh, yeah. Or maybe... <laughs> 
That's lots, lots of time, right? That's, we don't spend that time coaching projects. But on Scrum, by the way, Kim is a 17-time Dutch champion karate. But so um, um, that was, that was uh, yeah, pretty cool. So uh, anyway, um, uh, in Scrum, you can also do that, right? You take the two-day course, you take the certificate, and you're a Scrum master. <laughs> Scrum master of the universe, even, I guess, right? So and then you can save any project that goes off the cliff anywhere. So, right? so we need certification, too. So what are we going to do? So basically, um, you also can become a certified flow resource, and who doesn't want to put that on a CV, right? So um, uh, what we think of, what we do in our courses is uh, you learn how to rip off post-it notes. That's <laughs> mandatory, of course. Um, also, you learn, to learn how to move items on a Jira board, which is pretty complex if you take into account all the workflows that you can organize in Jira. Um, also, you learned how to decorate your workplace and some origami on the side. Uh, and uh, by the way, we thought, well, two-day courses is way too long because we need to cash in on the certification. So basically, what, what if you do this keynote, well, and then do the exam, you might become certified as well. It's not a good idea, right? So there we go. We're actually going to do the certification right now. So what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, first question. Make sure yeah. you write them down for yourself. Yeah, by um, the way, we do three questions. That's, that's enough. We do three questions, yes. And if you think it's too hard, you can stop after two. So um, what roles do we have in Flow? Um, manager, project managers, and product owners. Hmm. Um, we are all one team. Or is it uh, lots and lots, except for the testers? Um, yeah, or obviously. resources? <laughs> yeah, good question. Where's the resources go? Oh. Oh. Oh, there, there they are. Yeah. Right. So, question two: Why do we have retrospectives in Flow? Uh, answer A is to interrupt the daily flow of our resources. Hmm. Sounds plausible, right? To endlessly discuss why the resources in our projects should work harder because it's their fault. Um, to make sure we spend two days preparing demos, or to watch demos fail together with our clients. <laughs> and the last question. Yes. So you can stop now. Uh, we have certification in Flow because we want well-trained resources in our projects, or um, it makes our methodology look important. Is it because Flow is so complex, you need lots and lots of training to become an expert, or is it because we want to make money? So remember all your questions, right? We're now going to check whether you actually um, check the right uh, uh, answers. And uh, if you have, then you're our certified Flow resource too. And the good news is, um, you all passed. <laughs> well done, well done. So, any of the answers is good. Uh, and by the way, if you're quick, um, um, you can uh, just make a screenshot of this or a picture and then you, you can put it in the wall in your office or at home, wherever you work these days, right? So, uh, I'll give you a moment of time to do this. Um, no, 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 but that's, that's uh, uh, apart from the serious stuff, right? Uh, by the way, there's uh, an annual continuation fee of 200 euros. So I think we should look at what we actually, actually believe in, right? So this is, this is the serious stuff of this talk. Yeah, so what do we believe in? Well, we believe in um, that software is built by people. It is still not done by ChatGPT, not yet, um, or um, any other AI tool. We use Copilot, actually, so it's nice for lots of typing. But we do it, right? Building software does not take place on the keyboard. It takes place in your head. That means you need to be clear in your head. You need to be okay with the world, basically, to make sure that you can write the decent software or that you can understand the problems at hand. And that is crucial. Yes, and we believe that every organization will develop um, and create and evolve an approach that fits them best. Spotify doesn't do the Spotify model anymore because their context changed. Your context is different. You need to find it out yourself. It's okay to be inspired by others and to, to learn from what really worked for them, but also always read up on the why behind it. Why did it work before you start blindly adopting it? Yeah, and also, um, I think personal communication is still key. So I was, we were just joking about sending messages to each other. I love being in the team, with, in the same room with my team, and just having a chat and being able to work together and look together at code face to face. Um, and, and I think all that personal communication, it, it's still so vital to our work, right? It is not just sitting behind the keyboard. It is being able to go out and talk to other people, talk to people on your team, whether that's remote or in hybrid mode or in the office. Uh, um, I, it's just so fun. So much better to work with people. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's why they invented headsets, right? So <laughs> communication with a microphone. Yeah, is communication with a microphone it. is so much better than communication without a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so, and we believe that trust and personal safety rule. So, um, I think that people in IT, I experience them as the most uh, kind, gentle, creative, and smart people I ever um, experienced. And people are kept so small. Uh, there's so little space to actually use all this creativity and all this uh, intelligence. Um, these people are managing, um, dealing with the main assets of your company, your IT. Trust them. If they cannot handle them, don't let them touch the code at all. Yeah, and still, it requires a lot of focus, right? It requires a lot of attention, being able to be there, to be in the flow, and to make sure that you can write the code that you need to write, and to understand the problems that you're working on. And, and that means that you yourself are responsible for getting into this place, right? Making sure that you don't accept all the 10 meeting, oh, sorry, microphone, all the 10 meeting invites that you get every day, right? Make sure that you're only there when you need to be. You get to set your own boundaries, right? If you don't, you don't get to be a flow, you don't be uh, productive, as they call it, right? Yeah, and continuous learning is essential, like, like keeping the microphone in front of your mouth, right? Yes. Um, so in, in yes, tech, Kim. it's the same. I, uh, things change every day at a speed we, we really cannot keep up. And learning is hard, and it's especially hard when your team is constantly in stress mode. When you're working from sprint to sprint to sprint, there's no time to guide and teach people who are new to your team. You need to make space. You need to think ahead, like what do they know? What's their, their uh, new step? How can, we, how can we help somebody proceed? Because if we don't find the ability to learn, tech is dead. Yes, true, very true. Um, and uh, I think, and uh, this is a thing I've been working on for like two decades probably, is to, to try and get to people to be more self-organized. And at my current client, I actually, or we should say probably, we actually managed to do this. And there's a team now out there that's working without me, since I'm being here, right, and I just write part of the code. Um, and, and they are like almost totally self-organizing. It's actually the first time that I've managed to to, well, make a team with the rest of the team that, that is actually self-organized to a level that I think that we all should be. And it's a really hard thing, but it's a really powerful thing. It's also a wonderful thing to work with a team that is so self-organized because they, they take all the decisions themselves. There's very little decisions that we need to go up to the to hierarchy of the organization and then come back. We do almost everything ourselves. And the reason we can is because we learned how to uh, to produce basically, or or basically how to um, um, to get the stuff out there all the time on a daily basis, and that means we gain a lot of trust, and with trust comes autonomy, and that's a really good thing. Yeah. And, and even take it one step further, organizations need to be as flat as possible with as little hierarchy as possible. And it's not the same thing as self-organizing. Nope. Um, I'm working at a company that has been self-organizing since 2001, and we have hierarchy. It's an informal hierarchy. So people need to be aware of their informal um, uh, power and their effect on people. And you need to be able to deal with it. So is everybody in your team actually having a voice? Is everybody actually invited to have a voice? That is something you can do regardless of any managerial hierarchy. You can make sure it's safe for everybody to speak up and to be inclusive and find ways to be. Exactly. And, uh, and the last thing is, so um, I'm, I'm still playing football at my age. And, and there was this guy, it's a re very recent story, um, and he was 79 and he was still playing football. And he had been playing football for 68 years. And it was the last match of the season, literally, and they were going to be champion. And we were, we were like, we ended sixth, I think, in the competition. But, uh, and they won. And, and they, uh, they, he got in the last five minutes because, well, he doesn't, well, he's 79, right? How do you play football when you're 79? He got in, he scored a goal. He scored the last goal of the team. And this was for him the first time that he became champion in his whole career as a football player in 68 years, right? That is perseverance, right? That's cool. So I think um, to end the story with, or almost end the story with, is that experience, and I can say that as an old guy, right? Experience is so much more relevant than certification or what have you do, because it's eventually, it's, more, it's getting to be more intuitive, right? It's in your muscle memory. Uh, and that's where... Um, experience can help the, the younger or less experienced people to actually get to that level too. And that's very, very relevant. Yeah, and uh, Agile should reduce complexity. We see a lot of Agile methodologies that actually make it worse and not better. Yep. If that's the case, discuss it. Yeah. It shouldn't be. And the last thing is actually never, ever, ever forget to have fun. Because we are in the best, most complex, but also most fun industry there is out there in the world, right? So, and with that, 
I think we're there, right? Yes. We, we finished and we can get beer. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>